Thanks, everybody, for uh, joining. I'm here to um, talk about how cloud providers are setting you up for failure. And by that, I mean for security failure. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about the, how different cloud providers like Amazon Web Services, Azure, and GCP design their services to uh, be easy to use or to compete with other providers, but often have insecure defaults or are not giving good guidance so that people are basically configuring them in a way that's very insecure or could lead to a compromise. Um, and so just to get an idea, um, I can't really see a show of hands, but um, who here is using Amazon Web Services as their main cloud provider? So it's like a number of people. What about Azure? Got some Azure people. What about GCP? Do we got any GCP people? We got one, <laughs> two. <laughs> okay. I'll try to cover uh, most of the providers and how, what they're doing, but I'll focus mostly on, on AWS and um, Azure. So just a quick, uh, uh, a little bit about myself. I'm from Canada. I'm from that island furthest east. It's my first time in Poland. It's been a great experience so far. And uh, I work every day helping companies uh, improve security. I'm lucky to work with uh, startups, the Fortune 500 companies. And uh, sometimes you meet a company on the best of days and sometimes on the worst. And by that I mean sometimes you come in after a security incident or a breach has happened. Uh, I love building for the cloud, so I'm talking a lot of crap about cloud providers, but I do like love building with, with each of these providers. I'm kind of traumatized, though, from assessing so many cloud environments and how they're configured. Uh, it, it's just the majority of uh, environments that I go into have significant uh, misconfiguration. And so you kind of can see this in, in the media whenever there's a, a breach. And you can see that over the last few years, there's been constant constant number of breaches that have been everything from storage buckets to a web server that's misconfigured and gives access to the cloud environment. So maybe we should just start back, I guess, at how leadership and companies are looking at the cloud. And weirdly enough, there's this misconception that because we use, say, Amazon Web Services, we are secure. So they're basically saying that the cloud provider is going to handle a lot of the security pieces for you, when in reality, a lot of that is just misconception. And Amazon Web Services, as an example, they kind of pioneered this. They kind of created this model of what they're responsible for the security of the cloud, which is like the hardware, the data centers. Sometimes they patch certain things, but for the most part, a lot of these things, the security configuration is on the customer, like who gets access to what. Um, when you're making something internet accessible, those pieces are on the customer. And Azure kind of has a similar kind of breakdown too. They kind of get into more specifics because there's some services where the cloud provider handles more for you versus when it's just like a virtual machine that you kind of configure it yourself. So looking at these models, you, you kind of can see that they're not taken care of, like if your server is internet accessible when it shouldn't be, and it gets, gets compromised. And oftentimes we've seen that they basically will throw the customer under the bus and say it's kind of on you to kind of configure things correctly. So from a customer perspective, you kind of need to understand your responsibilities when moving into the cloud, or if you're currently operating in the cloud. Look at things like identity and access management, uh, network architecture, application security, uh, patching and vulnerability management for the things that you're responsible for. Uh, things like budget, like how much money are you allocating for security in the cloud? Because it, it doesn't necessarily come for free. And so you kind of need to understand what, what you'll have to pay for that. And then from the cloud pro provider's perspective, when they're designing these services, when they're introducing like a new service, uh, they're trying to provide something that's low cost, um, uh, basically provide cheap and sometimes insecure paths to get up and, and running. So they'll kind of give you like a, a new service and say, here, just go and build on it. But to actually secure it properly, it's quite expensive. So it's low cost if you implement it insecurely, basically. They also design it for ease of use. Um, so it's easy to get up and going with. They also are releasing features uh, to get ahead of competition. And breaches are pretty much on the customer when they happen. Um, sometimes we've seen that customer and government pushback can help change how they configure services by default. But oftentimes, it, it's kind of like it's on the customer. And there are some gray areas in this model. Um, so. If there's a service that to configure it correctly, it's really complicated or expensive to properly secure it. 
is that responsibility on the cloud provider or is it left to the customer? Um, if, if you had to basically create this really complicated network security situation to kind of be secure, how can they sp expect all customers to kind of, kind of do that? Um, there's also insecure configurations based on defaults and ease of use. And there could also be that the service itself is inherently insecure. So there's a couple that have happened on Amazon Web Services, such as the um, metadata service that's available on their EC2s. Um, that was basically accessible to anybody who can access the EC2, for example. Storage buckets have also been prone across all of the cloud providers to be vulnerable if misconfigured, and oftentimes it's very easy to misconfigure them. Um, and, and so like Amazon Web Services has added additional guidance and uh, defaults for some of these services, but for the most part, um, they're still mostly insecure by default. So one good example of this shared responsibilities model and where it kind of breaks down uh, was the Capital One breach, which happened in 2019. And basically, basically what happened in this, uh, this breach was the attacker um, used an application vulnerability on one of Capital One's um, applications and was able to basically make a request to the metadata service that provides temporary credentials to the EC2. Um, and basically there's a HTTP endpoint that you can access temporary credentials from. And that represents the identity of the server to, to access other AWS services. And so the attacker downloaded that, those credentials, got them from that vulnerability, and then the Capital One had basically over-provisioned it to have access to all their S3 buckets. So the attacker could use the temporary credentials and then download all their data from the S3 buckets. And that's exactly what happened. So obviously there's some of this that's on the customer to, to kind of properly provision access, but was AWS doing enough to kind of prevent this? And this particular breach was, got so much media attention, it actually went in front of the US Congress and AWS basically threw a Capital One under the bus for this one. And uh, they did make some changes eventually to this service, um, but, but it still has an insecure default. And we still see attackers using the same metadata service. Um, they abuse it using application vulnerabilities. And uh, Mandiant has actually done a lot of research on this uh, more recently. So every breach you see in the media is kind of the tip of the iceberg. Um, really, uh, like in my line of work, I, I continuously see customers who come to us after a breach has happened, and it's ransomware attacks. So it's things where they go in and download the database, delete it, and leave a note saying basically pay up or we'll publish the database online. Um, so a lot of these are not being fully covered because companies don't want to disclose that these breaches are happening. So just looking at like who who are, who's, who are these groups that are actually doing these types of attacks? And so you kind of have nation states that um, are kind of more destructive, that are trying to do sabotage, uh, that are trying to disrupt businesses in certain locations. And so they're going in and just deleting everything and it's more for geopolitical kind of aims. The more common one now is cyber criminals. So they'll take some of the techniques and tactics from the nation state actors and they'll basically, um, commercialize it. So they basically create like a commercial uh, enterprise out of this by ransoming it out. They even have a customer support in some cases where they'll like manage different, uh, different people that they've compromised or different companies they've compromised. Then there are smaller actors like hacktivists that also kind of are more destructive, that have more ideological type aims. And then there are others as well, like even insiders that kind of leave a company and they're mad with their employers. So they go back and delete all the the data in the cloud. So like I said, there's kind of a lack of reporting on these types of attacks. Um, a GCP, or, or I guess Google, has released some reporting on this, what they see. And they're saying in 86% of cases is for cryptocurrency mining, which is pretty common uh, when you get access to a cloud server. But really nowhere on this list is ransomware, which is becoming more and more common from, from what I can see. So some of the areas where, like what an attacker is trying to do are extortion or ransom. In my opinion, cloud providers need to provide better direction and better uh, defaults or secure defaults for their customers. So the first area that I wanna look at is basically setting up boundaries between different environments. And so this is probably one of the more 
common things I see. So you get in, you get a new account, or you have an existing account, and you kind of start building resources in this one account. Um, and you're, you're not really set up with a good foundation. Um, and cloud providers really need to provide templates or uh, directions when people are starting out or moving into the cloud for the first time. And so what I mean by uh, starting with a good foundation, each of the major cloud providers has this idea of a container that kind of provides identity and access management boundaries. So in AWS, it's an AWS account. In Azure, it's a subscription. In GCP, it's a project. And they provide a way to kind of separate environments. So you may have like dev, staging, production, security account, uh, logging account. And the idea is if an attacker gets into, say, your dev environment, they're not going to be able to go further into production. So a lot of times, what I see is that customers are basically keeping everything in the same account. And so you have like dev, staging, production, a compromise happens, and they just have everything. They have access to everything. And then you kind of can organize or apply policies and different settings to these separate accounts using um, an organization service. So again, each of the major cloud providers has a version of this. And so you can kind of create as many granular accounts as you want and then kind of apply policies to restrict access as you need it. So this is a quick example of in Azure what it can look like. Um, I've never actually seen a complex example like this implemented in Azure, but this is from Microsoft documentation. And you can basically use what are called management groups to kind of organize your subscriptions and then apply policies as needed. And the same thing in Amazon Web Services. This is a, a recommendation here from Amazon Web Services on how to divide up your AWS accounts. So you have like your management account, um, a security tooling account, a logging account, and then each of your um, applications could have a separate account as well and then divide them up by like development and production. And again, by doing that, you kind of reduce the blast radius of what an attacker can, can do. So these are just some quick resources. Um, there's not a lot of resources from the cloud providers on how to easily configure this, but um, there's an open source project called AWS uh, Organization Formation that kind of generates templates for you that you can use to configure your organization. Um, th there's also service built into AWS called Control Tower. Tower. It's still not great. Um, it can be used for most situations, um, but if you get into larger environments, it doesn't really have the flexibility you need. Um, and if you use Terraform, there's a, a Terraform account factory that can be used to basically configure all new accounts going forward. So I definitely recommend checking out those uh, types of resources. So then beyond uh, just the container for identity and access management, you need to look at identity holistically. Uh, so identity is really becoming more important in networking uh, within the cloud. And so when you get into um, like Amazon, for example, the first thing you're kind of instructed to do is create IAM users. And what I'm going to say is avoid using IAM users if at all possible, and avoid using access keys if all possible. They're very difficult to manage with multiple accounts. And access keys are commonly disclosed. So I see all the time uh, access keys being committed to source code. And it's a, that's a really big problem. There's often a built-in service for single sign-on. And I would recommend looking at that instead. So you can use something like AWS SSO. Um, and Microsoft and GCP kind of have it built in automatically. So avoid like IAM users, if at all possible. And also limit who can add users and also guest users. So one really bad uh, default in Azure is that you can invite any email address into your tenant. So you can invite Hotmail e uh, email addresses, Gmail email addresses, and you have no control over them. And I often see them just sitting there with access to Azure. Then there's machine access. So this is like your applications that need to interact with the cloud provider or servers that need to interact with them. So again, instead of using access keys or client secrets, 
um, basically try to use IAM roles or uh, managed identities. Those kinds of things generate temporary credentials so that um, there's no way for an attacker to really steal or uh, utilize them uh, over a long period of time. Period of time. Sadly, Azure generates account keys, like static account keys, for some resources automatically, and you can't turn it off. It really sucks. Um, that includes like storage accounts and event hubs. Um, so do your best to rotate them if, if you can't avoid it. Uh, try to implement granular IAM policies and avoid managed policies whenever possible. And um, managed policies kind of provide too much access and are more meant for users. And then finally, uh, for your like CI CD pipelines that are coming deploying code from like GitHub or Bitbucket, definitely check out OIDC authentication. It allows you to do something really cool and avoid access keys. And basically, what you can do is define an IAM policy that references a GitHub bucket or a GitHub repo that's allowed to deploy code into an AWS account. So definitely check out switching if you have like a CI CD pipeline right now that uses access keys. I would highly recommend switching to this right away. And then finally, there's third parties that have to interact with your cloud provider. Um, and it's often difficult for vendors to figure out how to kind of uh, interact with AWS. And so a lot of them are insecure in how they actually connect into your account. So definitely understand how third parties are connecting in. Uh, if they're giving you something like a CloudFormation template, review it to make sure you're not giving them like administrator access. And then also look for what's called an external ID in AWS specifically. And that means that uh, it basically it's an ID for cross account access that allows the provider, like the vendor, to tell which customer is which. And if you don't have that, it can lead to vulnerabilities where um, one customer could access another customer's AWS account, for example. So definitely review the, the types of access the third parties have into your account. And then in terms of like authorization, what level of access people get into your provider, um, there's this option to kind of use managed policies, which are um, provided by the, the cloud provider that are kind of like easy out of the box defaults. Understand them and don't blindly trust them because oftentimes they could give like full access to S3, for example, um, or um, allow users to create like IAM users, for example. Uh, so this is a problem across all providers. Each of them has like a, a weird issue with each of these. So like Amazon often gives way too much access to storage or IAM. Uh, GCP often applies things at the project level. So if there's a compromise, you get access to the full project. So definitely avoid using these if you can help it. Um, also be aware that there's deprecated policies. So in Amazon Web Services, there's policies that are so bad that they basically said you shouldn't use them anymore. So check your accounts to make sure you're not using them. Uh, they'll just put a warning. They leave them there, but they give you a warning that says they're deprecated. And finally, you don't control them. So uh, just be aware that they could change these at any time. And Amazon Web Service Services has been mistakes in the past where they've given access and didn't detect it until hours later that they had added extra access to a managed policy. So as an example of where access keys are a problem and why I'm recommending to avoid them, there was a recent breach that, that was in the media related to GitHub and NPM. And basically, this was where uh, the attacker had gotten OAuth tokens from Heroku originally and were able to access any repo that Heroku had access to. And they basically enumerated all the customers that all these GitHub repos, and they identified certain ones and just downloaded them and uh, started going through the source code. One of those was NPM's uh, repo. And so the attacker found access keys to their S3 storage in that repo and could use that to download all their backups for NPM. And it included, I think, over 100,000 password hashes of users going back several years. So this is an example of even companies like GitHub um, that are aware of a lot of these things have a difficult time like removing things like access keys from, from source code. So the next area I think that would really help with security is 
in the cloud is setting up developers for su success. And so there are a lot of built-in features in the cloud providers, but they're not really promoted very well uh, that can help here. So one thing I would suggest is creating guardrails for developers so they can't create or use certain sensitive functionality um, unless they need it. So in AWS, this is service control policies. And you can go in and say you can't create resources in this region, or you can only create resources in a certain region, basically. Um, also, I would recommend looking at easy and secure dev environments and facilitating access in a secure way. So if developers need access to AWS or to a dev environment, have a, a, an easy path for them to do it, and so they're not going and creating resources uh, in AWS th themselves. And so some guardrails that you could look at doing with service control policies um, could be things like restricting which regions can be used. Um, so cryptocurrency mining is it's pretty common for them to get into an environment and use like a different region than you're actively using. So a good way to kind of mitigate that risk is to set up region restrictions. So instead of uh, having like two dozen regions restricted to just um, Europe West or uh, North America, that kind of thing. Um, also control uh, if users can make things public. So that's another problem that, that has come up, especially with Lambda functions. And prevent disabling security controls. So like prevent somebody from going in and disabling security monitoring or using the root account or disabling logging. And so this is just an example, like Azure has Azure policy that kind of does this as well. And you can like restrict and select which regions and then kind of enforce it uh, for different resources. So then on easy dev environments, so I see a lot of companies starting to do this where they're making it easy to basically deploy dev environment quickly, um, oftentimes using something like Slack or Teams to kind of generate it. Or even if somebody does like a pull request, you can generate a dev environment for them uh, to test that, that pull request. And so this uh, reduces the need for cloud access for the developer. Um, you can make it so that non-production shouldn't be internet accessible, so you have like a standard secure build. Um, you can also have a short time to live, so once the PR is merged, maybe the dev environment gets destroyed. And that way, like fresh dev environments are basically always have the latest security updates, there's less idle resources, and people are not asking, like, can I use your dev environment? Um, that kind of thing. You can also look at moving uh, de some development to local to local testing and local development. And so it, local testing is difficult with cloud services, but it's not impossible. So one open source project I definitely recommend looking at is uh, local stack. Uh, basically, it simulates um, some of the a AWS APIs like S3. Uh, so you don't have to directly connect to AWS to test like S3 or um, SQS or, or different services like that. Some serverless frameworks also have local testing, so like the serverless framework does. And then you could also uh, start building or simulating some of the cloud services using things like VS Code and dev containers, or if you're using Kubernetes, Minikube. So the idea here is like you don't have credentials set up for developers, they just test locally if it's something fairly basic. You can also make uh, uh, IAM access easier for developers. So to avoid like access keys and those kinds of things, you can set up single sign-on. And the way it works is you can use, use the cloud provider's command line uh, interface to basically pop up a browser login. They log in in the browser. It generates temporary credentials for them. And then they can do the work that they need to do. That way, there's no permanent credentials stored locally and kind of reduces that, that risk. Uh, one open source project I would highly recommend that, to support this type of setup, make it easy, is AWS-Vault. It's by 99, or Design99, and um, basically it's a way to store securely the temporary credentials uh, that get generated. And then also provide like read-only and different levels of access to developers. Don't give administrator access to everybody is often not needed. Like if, if you just want to monitor something, uh, look at using a read-only role. 
And this can also be tied into Kubernetes if you're using managed Kubernetes or into database access. For example, in AWS, you can use it with the RDS service. And then beyond identity, there's also uh, network access to these development environments. Uh, GCP and Azure kind of have some options available out of the box, but AWS doesn't really have anything. Um, so there's some cool third-party services. Uh, one is Cloudflare Tunnels, which I definitely recommend checking out, and Cloudflare Access, which kind of throws up a single sign-on screen to get network access into your development environment. Uh, Tailscale is also becoming pretty popular. The uh, traditional approach is VPN, but often that's an impediment because everybody has to connect to VPN, and it's, it's, a, it's a pain to kind of set up. So here's an example of where non-production environments being on the internet can kind of cause issues. So this actually happened to uh, a customer that I was dealing with that I learned of after the fact. And they had a non-production environment. It was internet accessible. They had a misconfiguration uh, that allowed environment variables to be served for like debug purposes. And so there's constant scanning on the internet for environment variables. Uh, misconfigured and be able to download and get those secrets from the environment variables file. And so they download the attacker downloaded it for the dev environment and they found that basically you could use the same credentials uh, but with the production database. And the attacker actually downloaded the production database, deleted it, and left a ransomware message for them. So this is becoming a, a pretty common scenario where people are just constantly scanning for these types of misconfigurations. And so this is an example of a graph from a service called Gray Noise, which is uh, pretty cool to kind of monitor the background noise of scanning on the internet. And so they, you can see that there's kind of like a constant um, scanning for environment variables. So if you misconfigure this, you're probably already compromised uh, if you have it on the internet. So then kind of going into understanding what is exposed to the internet and how to reduce it, so you want to like look at doing an inventory, which is somewhat difficult in most of the cloud providers. But just be aware that some resources can just be internet accessible. So S3, KMS, ECR, they all can be internet accessible without authentication, which is really scary. Um, resources like Lambdas can now also be directly accessible on the internet. Um, Azure and GCP are not really even trying. They default to being internet accessible for things like Key Vault, which is kind of scary if your secret store is accessible from all networks by default. Um, and then control planes like Kubernetes and databases, uh, and then misconfigured or excessive security groups. So basically, if you have virtual machines that, that are internet accessible. And then you start looking at, like, what can I do to kind of monitor uh, for these types of issues happening, like uh, people attacking or getting into the environment. So there are some available options from the different providers. Uh, there's Guard Duty, Security Center, and uh, basically each provider has like a security monitoring solution. Uh, but they kind of provide a false sense of security. They, they don't work the way you expect. A lot of companies trust them, and they think that this covers all security monitoring. That couldn't be further from the truth. Um, basically, Guard duty has a set like two dozen rules, and they'll detect like really obviously bad stuff like some crypto mining, but they're not going to detect anything beyond th those basic things. So definitely would recommend looking at like third-party options. Don't rely on the built-in um, monitoring. Um, it, it just doesn't work in reality in a lot of cases, and sometimes they they make you pay for security. In the case of like Azure. It's just like continuous add-ons for, for security in a lot of times. And so like this is an example of guard duty. And the only time I've ever seen a lot of these detections is from samples because they're so rare and they don't really look at real types of um, attack scenarios. So I kind of have a wish list of what I would like to see in security monitoring. Um, I think they should make a lot of this free and enabled by defaults for a lot of customers. Uh, for, or for all customers, provide a way for customers to customize uh, the monitoring, uh, provide a lot of visibility into the alerts, uh, 
uh, provide better inventories. And if you are using something like Azure uh, Security Center, make sure you go in and look at the findings. There's probably already findings in there from people actively attacking your environment. A lot of times I see that people just never look at them. So even though they do just provide basic monitoring, definitely go in and look at what, what it is finding. Then there's networking, uh, which is kind of complicated in the cloud. You can get started pretty quickly, but you don't really have all the security features out of the box. And so there's this ridiculous diagram that's kind of, this is AWS's ideal network architecture. I'm not even gonna explain it, but basically you need to have multiple VPCs, you need to have uh, a VPC just for outbound network connections. Um, it gets quite elaborate. So this is not really feasible for most customers out of the box. And uh, it's, it's not a great situation with networking in the cloud. And again, Azure and GCP, they kind of make everything uh, internet accessible by default, and it's also outside your private network. Uh, like even if you create a database, it's in their kind of like weird network and not actually in your private network. AWS at least is a bit more into traditional network concepts. Um, so th there's a lot of issues, I guess, with networking right now. Uh, and then network architectures are often pricey and complicated if you want to do it properly. And just one last thing on default networks. AWS has a default network that gets created in every single region by default. I wish they would turn that off because basically that's where people put servers and they're often misconfigured to be internet accessible. So these are just some of the things you're missing out on if you don't have like the full blown network set up and you're missing out on things like network logging and a bunch of other security features and the problem is when a compromise happens, you don't have anywhere to go to find out what actually happened if, if these things are not enabled. Um, so a lot of companies are kind of just deciding to accept the risk or they're, they're just unaware and then a compromise happens and they, they just have no logs that they can go back to. So then there's secrets management, which is also a complicated thing in the cloud. Um, people will find weird places to put secrets in, in different cloud providers. So like I see all the time CloudFormation templates that have passwords and API keys in the inputs and outputs uh, in plain text. Uh, it could also be a Lambda function where it's in the environment variables in plain text. Um, honestly, if most people, if you have a large enough environment, if you go in and start looking, you will probably find secrets in environment variables. Uh, that are accessible to everybody that has like general read-only access. Uh, it could also be, th be things like classic apps in Azure um, or uh, startup scripts used to create servers. There's also weak or shared passwords that happen with databases in a lot of cases where people will just share um, credentials for the database. There's no real good way to deal with this or the setup of it to actually have individual logins for the database. Um, there's RDS IAM, which I'd recommend looking at, which is basically using IAM authentication to get into the database, um, but it's not a great solution either way. And so yeah, so look at using like SSM Parameter Store, Secrets Manager, Azure Key Vault. These, these should be straightforward ways to kind of store secrets and be as granular as possible with access to them. Uh, and uh, avoid creating secrets if you don't need to. So if you can use a IAM role instead, use that. And this is actually a tweet from uh, Chris Ferris where he's actually showing the GCP secrets manager. And they have this weird feature where you can basically exempt a user from audit logging, which I have no idea why you would create a feature for this, but basically any user added there, you will never have logs that they access your secrets. So. It's, I'm kind of puzzled sometimes by what I see in GCP. And then Kubernetes, this is kind of a tricky topic, but my recommendation would be don't go there unless you have to. Um, managed Kubernetes is not really fully baked yet. Uh, it's not so managed. Um, work is in progress with uh, a lot of decisions, or b basically a lot of decisions are left on the user to figure out around things like IAM, logging, secrets ma management, patching, um, 
and it's all not really great right now. Um, some, some providers are better in different areas, but for the most part, like a lot of these things are just, you kind of have to figure it out yourself and uh, defaults are not great. The management API is also internet accessible with all of the providers by default, which I have no idea why they do that. I guess ease of use, but um, basically all of the Kubernetes clusters APIs, you could access it from your personal home computer, your corporate Kubernetes cluster basically, if, if that's on by default. And the, the problem, I guess, with Kubernetes is that everybody's using it, so I guess we just had to learn to accept it. And then finally, uh, don't always trust the manual. So sometimes I'll, I'll have customers that come to me and say, but AWS is saying in their documentation that uh, this is how I should do this. Uh, but there's a lot of weird stuff in the documentation when you actually read it. So one is deploying the Kubernetes dashboard. I think it's a probably a bad idea to deploy this in the first place. But if you do, uh, it's basically like a shared secret that everybody's using to log in based on this particular tutorial. Uh, so I definitely recommend being careful about some of these things and definitely don't use some of these in, in production. Um, and this is another one. A customer actually said, well, AWS is telling me this, so I'm allowed to do it kind of thing. And basically, it's creating an IAM user that has full S3 access that everybody is sharing to look at logs. And I have no idea why they don't have a, a warning sign or something on it, but uh, you'll find these things scattered throughout like all the provider's documentation. And then developers kind of play a, a very big role in cloud security. Uh, development teams are often the first to get into building stuff in the cloud, uh, even before like there's DevOps teams in a lot of companies. And, and still, like, in larger companies, development teams are often deploying resources directly. So I guess in, in terms of helping into reducing risk, uh, definitely assume everything is internet accessible because <laughs> it's very easy to misconfigure. Uh, so think about things like not, not having test accounts with like password as password or debug modes, making sure everything is patched. Um, help make uh, security controls easier by building tools. So some companies build like command line wrappers around all the commands a developer needs to use to say access Kubernetes or access AWS. And so making these tools available to all the development team lets them work more efficiently and allows them to be more secure because they're not going around your security controls. Uh, test and implement granular, granular IAM access for your applications. So if your web application, say it's a WordPress site or something, doesn't need access to all your S3 buckets, just give them access to one. Um, this has been like a, a big issue recently where a small, like an application compromise leads to a full compromise of the cloud environment. And then build resources like virtual machines or Lambda functions in a private network, uh, even if it is more difficult, start off with it not on the internet by default, because there's just too many people scanning looking for vulnerabilities right now. And um, it's better to keep it off the internet until it, it's at least production ready or gone through some uh, security evaluation. So that kind of covers a, a bit of my rant going through all the providers. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions and also to hear if you have any uh, pain points when it comes to security in any of these providers. Yes. <laughs> 
Yeah, so just to repeat, um, I guess being forced to use access keys or secrets that you don't want to because the vendor or AWS doesn't support that configuration, and then also handling of passwords with SDKs. So Tableau is actually a good example. I've, I've seen a lot of cases where it's been compromised with Log4j, and uh, it's a really bad situation if you have access keys or any other secrets, and then they get full access and ransomware your entire environment. Um, I don't have a good solution or answer for you. Go to Tableau and tell them it's ridiculous that yeah. you have to do that. And if you have a provider, if you have a cloud provider that's not giving you a good way to handle passwords, try to use their secrets management as best you can. If not, um, I'd like to know more details about it because I'd like to include it in my talk because I'm talking about it again in Warsaw. Um, any other questions? <laughs> uh, startup, I would say whichever one offers you the most credits. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't have a really great opinion. Like I like AWS because it has proper networking concepts and it's more traditional. Um, but depending on what you're doing, uh, GCP can get you by fine. Like if you're doing things like App Engine or Functions, it's it's probably fine. If you're doing something more complex, then AWS is probably a good bet. Uh, Azure is more, I think, enterprise uh, based and is a bit more expensive. Um, but I, I really like a lot of the things that Azure is doing in security. And I think they're really leading the way in security in a lot of ways. So I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, for start. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I think GCP and Azure are probably doing the best at making the customer aware of security problems. So, um, sadly, I think AWS are kind of on your own figuring out a lot of things. So you need to bring the knowledge or have people experience with it if you want to succeed. Yeah, I, I know that there's um, actually somebody speaking, I think, after my talk about uh, multi-cluster uh, Kubernetes. Definitely recommend going to that. He's talking about OpenShift, I think, as part of that. I'm not an expert in OpenShift. I tend to stay away from like non-cloud native things, but, uh, but yeah. Yeah, so uh, I haven't been repeating the questions, but this uh, this one's about infrastructure as code and if it can kind of help with this situation. And what I would say is, in a in an ideal world, you could do that. I just haven't seen a lot of companies be successful in keeping people out of doing manual changes, or that the providers in Terraform keep up with the changes in the the cloud providers. I definitely think it's a good way to go. Uh, and you kind of can build like modules that are secure by default. Uh, just be careful because there's some things like if you leave out certain um, attributes in a resource in Terraform, for example, it will go out with an insecure default. Uh, something like Sentinel is really good. Um, I haven't seen many companies like fully implement Sentinel, but in theory, I think it it could be a really good step in preventing uh, misconfigurations or poor security practices from getting into production. Cool. Well, thank you all for coming to my talk. <laughs>